The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome, friends. It is always, always such a joy to be with you. And we hope you leave here today jumping in to God's plan for your life here right now today. You are loved. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much. Your Holy Spirit is here in this place. Lord, we thank you that you have greater things set before us. I pray no matter what our health is, what our age is, what our bank account has, whatever it is we're going through, we thank you that greater things are still ahead for us. We trust in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for the message, John 14, 1 through 7 and 12 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Wow, amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 say, He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Jesus spread the word of God everywhere he went. And today we can use technology to spread his message to more people than ever. Christians can indeed have a healthy relationship with technology by using it to enhance their walk with Jesus. Now is the time to take advantage of all the different ways you can tune into Hour of Power any time of the day or week. Whether you're on the go or you're in the comfort of your home, Hour of Power is available not only through television, but 24 seven by streaming through the YouTube app on your smartphone or computer or tablet. You can also access real-time church news, special events, and online programs by visiting Our Power on our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. There's also our revamped website for all things Our Power, including special resources and offers. We have so many ways you can plug in and get connected to not only the Word, but to our online global community and friends at Our Power. To help you and your loved ones get plugged into all that Our Power has to offer online, we're excited to announce our special offers this month. Call, write, or go online today and request the Stay Connected Tech Bundle. Included in this set is a dual tablet and mobile device holder tailored for displaying a variety of cell phones and tablets, a dual USB port wall charger with two USB charging ports, and a power bank with a USB charging port that lets you take the power with you. We've included a QR code that when scanned with your phone's camera, you'll be directed to the most recent Hour of Power service online. We're asking for your gift of just $45 or more. For your gift of $65 or more, you'll receive this three item tech bundle as well as a tech accessories case. This leatherette carrying case will hold all of your tech essentials, so no more searching through your bag. Perfect for on the go. Call, write, or go online and request the Stay Connected Tech Bundle. It's your generosity and faithfulness to this ministry that makes our power possible for millions around the world to be moved by the power and goodness of God. We can't do the blessed work we do without you. You're the backbone of this ministry. Your faithful donations make it possible for Hour of Power to have an online presence and reach even more people. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we.
George Foreman, who is considered one of the greatest heavyweight boxers of all time, is also an entrepreneur known for the George Foreman Grill. After a near-death experience after a fight in 1977, George came to know Jesus and is now a minister of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Houston, Texas. The new movie, Big George Foreman, looks at his life and the challenges and triumphs that got him where he is today. Please welcome George Foreman. Well, Mr. George Foreman, what a joy it is to meet you. This is such a privilege. I, I actually had a chance to meet you back at the Crystal Cathedral under the concourse when you were being interviewed by my grandfather, Dr. Robert Schuler, and we were able to reconnect now because of Dr. James Davis, and what a privilege it is to see you on the big screen here in the, in the sanctuary. Welcome. Well, I'm happy to be with you. That's a wonderful name to bring up, Dr. Schuler. Happy to be with you. Well, he was uh, my hero and a hero to a lot of people. And like you as a minister, uh, I, I love that you are a minister of the gospel, but also uh, an accomplished business person, uh, a successful Hall of Fame boxer, of course, probably the thing you're most famous for. Um, in fact, I was talking, telling my wife I was interviewing you today. I was so excited. And she said, is that the guy from the George Foreman Grill? And I said, no, it's the Hall of Fame boxer. And she said, oh, well, who has the George Foreman Grill? I said, well, it's him too, you know, but he's a boxer. It's an amazing thing. And uh, let's talk a little bit first. I want to hear about your testimony of, of coming to faith, but I'd love to hear some boxing stories. Um, you were the first guy to beat Joe Frazier. And my understanding, I watched a movie about him that he was just a really dangerous guy. I think when you fought him, he was undefeated, and he was kind of the guy everybody was scared of. Is that true? And for good reasons. Joe Frazier, the giant killer, he slayed a lot of the big guys. So mm. I wanted to be champ, but I didn't want to face Joe Frazier. He'd beaten even Muhammad Ali. So when I got into to the ring with him and knocked him down once, I kept knocking him down after six times. He got up each time, though. They declared me the heavyweight champion of the world, one of the most happy moments of my life as an athlete. Wow, powerful. Now, that was in the 60s or 70s, I believe, late 60s. Is that right? Yeah, can you believe it? 1974 when that happened. 74. And then you, you won again. I, I don't know if this is something you're proud of. I would be super proud of it, but I think you're the oldest boxer ever to win a, win a heavyweight title. Is that true? I think you were 45 when you fought Michael Moore. Yeah, 20 years later, I became the heavyweight champion of the world again. Amen. I stopped boxing for 10 years and became an evangelist with the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for 10 years, I didn't even make a fist. I just dedicated my life to preaching, sometimes on the street corners and in different churches and arenas of all the world, giving that testimony about how I found God and Jesus. Awesome. Your movie just came out. I really want to encourage uh, people to see it. It's Big George Foreman, and it tells the story. It's an amazing movie. People should go watch it. But tell us a little bit of that story. How did you come to faith as a boxer? Well, I didn't believe in religion. I didn't even think it truly existed. I heard my mom and different people talking about it. But one night after a boxing match in 77, I was cooling off. Just couldn't get cool. And I was scared after a while, and I heard a voice within me said, because I knew I was about to die, you believe in God, why are you scared to die? And I was afraid. Mm -hmm. And I tried to fight for my life and lost it in the dressing room, dead in a split second, over my head, under my feet, was nothing. And I got upset, no hope anywhere. I said, I don't care if this, this is death. I still believe there's a God. And a gigantic hand reached into nothingness and gave me another chance to live. I saw blood on my head and forehead, for, uh, my forehead and hands, and I started screaming, Jesus Christ was coming alive in me. I didn't believe in those things. Hmm. Now I do, 46 years later. Do you believe, I remember when I heard, uh, read something about this, that it was almost like you feel like you went to hell or had some kind of hellish experience. Do, do you believe that happened or do you, is that true? Yeah, I was fighting for my life. I just yeah. couldn't, and my legs gave out on me. Yeah. And I was, if I explained death to you, it was nothing, just the most hopelessness, multiply every sad moment I'd had in my life wouldn't come close to what I felt to be nothing, non existent. And uh, 
I, I was scared. I saw everything I'd worked for crumble like ashes behind me. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any hope. You're like someone drop you in the sea and tell you to swim and there's nowhere to swim to. Mm -hmm. Until that moment, I said, I don't care if this is death. I believe, I still believe in God. And I was alive again, a second chance to live. Amazing. And so, so because of that experience, you, you became a Christian, you dove into your faith. And how did your life change after believing in Jesus? Yeah, for 10 years, I didn't box. I didn't even make a fist. Mm -hmm. I just dedicated my life to telling that story I just mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. Become a preacher, ordained. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then for 10 years, I went away and then I started working with kids at the youth center because so many kids just wouldn't come to church and I didn't want them getting into trouble going to jail. I started the youth center uh, and it took every fun, uh, all the funds I had to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, I couldn't let it go. I had to go back into boxing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you came back and you came back a champion, an amazing story. Your, your life is really a model of the American dream. I mean, I think about you, you were born into poverty, I believe, and had all sorts of struggles and challenges. And, and you really now you're you've, not just a successful boxer, a successful business person. You're a pastor now of a church. You're doing great things for the Lord. What advice do you have for someone who's watching now and maybe, maybe they grew up in a bad part of town or maybe they're in the rut or maybe they don't have a, you know, like a mom or dad and they're trying to figure out, maybe they're a young person, trying to figure out how to, how to succeed in life or um, what would you say to somebody who's kind of feeling stuck right now? Well, for me, the word hope, success, even setting of goals, that didn't even exist for me. That was a world where I knew no one, no one who had done anything. But I was given a chance by way of the Job Corps program where I learned vocational skills. And of course, I became champion of the world. But I can tell anyone coming into the United States afraid this is a chance to really do, do the impossible. It'll take a lot of prayer. Sometimes people were praying for me and I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. But I really come from nowhere to achieve everything possible. Mm -hmm. I love your new movie. Uh, tell people a little bit about the, your movie that just came out. It's called uh, Big George Foreman. Is that right? Yeah, the movie is all about redemption. I had I thought I had everything. I'd accomplished everything. And the movie tells a story about being on top of the world. All my dreams I thought had come true, but yet it all turned into a nightmare because I couldn't find really peace and happiness. Then death, alive again, and found faith, and you know, happiness as well. Amen. Well, I want to encourage people to go see the movie, Big George Foreman. It's out in theaters now. Mr. George Foreman, thank you so much. What a privilege it was to hear your story. Thanks for encouraging us to follow the Lord and to chase our dreams. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me.
thank you for joining us in worship today. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 say, He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Jesus spread the word of God everywhere he went. And today we can use technology to spread his message to more people than ever. Christians can indeed have a healthy relationship with technology by using it to enhance their walk with Jesus. Now is the time to take advantage of all the different ways you can tune into Hour of Power any time of the day or week. Whether you're on the go or you're in the comfort of your home, Hour of Power is available not only through television, but 24 seven by streaming through the YouTube app on your smartphone or computer or tablet. You can also access real-time church news, special events, and online programs by visiting Our Power on our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. There's also our revamped website for all things Our Power, including special resources and offers. We have so many ways you can plug in and get connected to not only the Word, but to our online global community and friends at Our Power. To help you and your loved ones get plugged into all that Our Power has to offer online, we're excited to announce our special offers this month. Call, write, or go online today and request the Stay Connected Tech Bundle. Included in this set is a dual tablet and mobile device holder tailored for displaying a variety of cell phones and tablets, a dual USB port wall charger with two USB charging ports, and a power bank with a USB charging port that lets you take the power with you. We've included a QR code that when scanned with your phone's camera, you'll be directed to the most recent Hour of Power service online. We're asking for your gift of just $45 or more. For your gift of $65 or more, you'll receive this three-item tech bundle as well as a tech accessories case. This leatherette carrying case will hold all of your tech essentials, so no more searching through your bag. Perfect for on the go. Call, write, or go online and request the Stay Connected Tech Bundle. It's your generosity and faithfulness to this ministry that makes our power possible for millions around the world to be moved by the power and goodness of God. We can't do the blessed work we do without you. You're the backbone of this ministry. Your faithful donations make it possible for Hour of Power to have an online presence and reach even more people. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Universe is full of up and down. It's full of light and dark. It's full of good and evil. It's full of beautiful and ugly. There's a heaven and a hell, a right and a wrong. And I think in my life, I have never heard someone regret doing the very best thing. Choosing light over dark, choosing good over e evil, even at personal expense. And I have for sure never heard of anyone regretting following Jesus. You will never regret doing the best thing in your life. You'll never regret giving it all. You will never regret really going forward in your life. You'll never regret having woken up and poured it on in a day and gone to bed knowing I really gave this day all that I have to become all that I could be for the people that need me, for the gospel, for the Lord, or for whatever it is that I got up for. I'm glad I got up for something this morning. You'll never regret having poured it on in a day. You'll never regret choosing the best over choosing the mediocre. Here's the best thing you can do today if you haven't done it. You can choose to follow Jesus. You know, if we, so many of us, when we see the faith of Christianity, we see it just like every other religion. It's a philosophy. It's a thing that has some nice things maybe we can learn from. But our faith requires, at some point in your life, a decision. You either choose the Lord or you don't. And I think it's so important that just in our own way, we decide to rely on Jesus Christ, that we ask for the forgiveness of sins, that we receive the renewal of our hearts, that we find a home in heaven. And I want to encourage you today to do that. When I did it, I just did it personally in my seat. I just made a choice. You can do that too. Make a choice to follow Christ. If you make that decision, 
I want to encourage you to plug into a good Bible-believing church. I want to encourage you to get baptized. And I want to encourage you to text me the word HOPE, the number on the screen, so we can pray for you. We are creatures that can choose to be all that we, are, we can be or choose not to be. I've heard this before, but I can't think of any other creature, except for maybe dogs and cats, that can choose to not be all that they were made to be. Imagine a tree saying, I'm going to be less than I am made to be. No, every tree reaches as high as it can go, and it puts as deep, its roots as deep as they can go, and it chooses to be all that it can be. And I want to encourage you today to get a hold of this idea that God still has the best things in store for your life. The best things. He has the greatest things still in store for your life. Hannah read from the scripture, John chapter 14. I'm going to preach out of that today. John 14 is located in a body of the scriptures from uh, John 14 to John 17 called the Departure Sermon. It's four chapters in which Jesus is comforting his disciples. These are young men and women, actually in the, in a, in the larger group, that left their families, left their jobs uh, and careers, and, and some of them they did it w with their parents kind of not totally supporting them. They're now about to, they don't know, about to go into a world that's going to try and kill them, that's going to persecute them, that's going to block them from participating in the economy. And Jesus is preparing them for this world before he goes to the cross. And in this part of John 14, he gives them a speech that's in three parts. And I like to look at this, John 14, as three keys to overcoming fear of death and decay. Anybody here afraid of death, decay, aging, weakness, sickness? Almost all of us have this little anxiety inside of us about facing the end of our life. I believe that fear of death drives a lot of the big mistakes we make in life. Ironically, keeps us from accomplishing all that we want to do and fulfilling all that we want to be. Very often, this fear of death and aging causes us to check out from life. You mean to prove the point to you? Imagine uh, a genie or a, I don't know, a fairy or something comes and en endows you with eternal life. You're not going to age anymore. You're not going to die. And also this is true for all the people that you love, your friends and your family. What would change in the way you spend your money, you spend your time? A lot would change. And that gives you a picture of part of what Christ wants to accomplish in our life. The way we live in the world, not crippled and driven by fear of death, but driven by a greater mission, a purpose in our life. And we'll get to that. So these disciples are going to face death, actually. Some of them uh, untimely death, murder. And here's what he says to them. Number one, the first thing he says is, be at peace. You know why? I am a carpenter. He goes, I'm a carpenter. And I have to go. I've got a building project somewhere else. And you'll see me there. And you know the way to get there because you spent the last three years for me. But I'm going to go build a house for you or build a place. Now, is that literally what it means? I think this is probably the best way to understand what's actually happening, that when we die, we're going to go to this place that Christ is preparing for us. That, that there is, in the world we live in, there is the world that we see, and then there's this hidden, more important and more powerful spiritual world that even in our own language and minds are very hard to define, but are made available to us who believe. He's going to that place, and he's going to do something so that when we get there, it's ready for us. And when we die, death will be more like waking up than falling asleep. So he says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And it's amazing. I think a part of this is, so in other words, don't worry about your death. You're found in me. Don't worry about it. Don't be crippled by death, all, your fear of death. It'll be okay. I'm surprised how many Christians, committed, wonderful people who know the Lord, who are full of the Spirit, still wonder if they'll get in. Will I get in? Am I really forgiven? Is it really true? Mr. Rogers, you remember this guy? Wonderful man. He, I, I just loved Mr. Rogers when I was a kid. He was so great because he had a way of talking to kids about serious topics like the assassination of the president or the fact that you won't go down the drain when the bathtub water goes out, you know, <laughs> a wide range of things. 
But what a wonderful man. His person in his personal life, he was a Presbyterian minister, actually part of our denomination, committed Christian. Loved children, fought and advocated for children. And his wife tells a story in a documentary about his life that I encourage you to watch. And while he was in bed, he was reading Matthew chapter 25, the passage about the sheep and the goats in the last days. There will be sheep and goats. And, the, and, and, and the, the, the sheep go to heaven and the goats don't, you know. And so he looks at his wife and he, sa he says, do you think God will count me among the sheep? And he was serious. And his wife said, Fred, if you're not counted among the sheep, we're all in trouble, you know. <laughs> But isn't it interesting, even someone like Mr. Rogers can feel afraid of that sometimes. Don't worry about it. If you've been baptized, if you've trusted your life, even if you've had your doubts, even if you had your rough days, if you made some mistakes, even if you've backslidden a couple times, even if it, you yelled at someone the other day, you're okay. It's not our good works that get us into heaven. It's our faith in Jesus. If you're friends with him, you're in. I think it's important. I remember hearing a story about a little girl who had bounced around um, from, from homes uh, as a, um, uh, not adoption, what do they call that? Um, yeah. There was a little girl who was a foster child, and she would be fostered, and very often the, the parents would consider adopting her, but right when they would consider it, her behavior would get worse. And it would get so bad, they'd send her back. One day, a young family adopted this, this girl, and they started talking about adopting her, and her behavior got worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, they decided, they put a contract together, they sat down with the girl, and they had her sign it, and they signed it, and it said, no matter how bad your behavior gets, we're never kicking you out of our family. We'll discipline you. We'll, we'll set boundaries. We'll set things right, but we'll never kick you out. And, it, and the story goes that after that, although it took some time, that is when her behavior actually improved. Because she knew she wasn't there because of good behavior. She knew she was there because she was family. It's a good way to think about our faith. Christ doesn't let you in because of good behavior. He adopted you. There's a contract. And by the way, that contract is signed in blood. It will remain true. And so we don't say, be good to get into heaven. We say, I know my home is in heaven. Now I'm going to build my life in response to God's love for me. I'll do the best I can. I'll do my best and forget the rest. Amen. Number two. So first Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. But number two, because I'm going to be gone, I'm going to send you my spirit. He's going to, the spirit, the paraclete, the power of God, it's going to come upon you and you'll be given this thing that you didn't have before you knew me. So first he says, don't worry, you're going to get into heaven, but now let's get heaven into you. I'm not going to, stop worrying about getting into heaven. Start worrying about getting heaven into you. The power of the Holy Spirit that when I wake up, I wake up with fire. I wake up with passion. I wake up with spirit. The ability to see obstacles and all that stands before me as not something that's in the way, but something that is the way. Remember what Marcus Aurelius said, I mentioned it last week. Fire, fire, fire thrives on obstacles. So we get heaven into us by being full of the Holy Spirit. I had a friend of mine, a new Christian, that asked me once, I don't understand this Holy Spirit thing. And I said, here's what I think happens. When you confess Christ as your Savior, when you receive a baptism, when you make that, that change in your life, you're not given a big ball of fire. You're given a pilot light and a tube of gas. Many of us who have been believers a long time, we totally, you get what I'm saying right now, don't you? You know what a pilot light is in your fireplace? A little blue light, you can barely see it, has to be dark, gives off no heat. But it's always there so that when you turn the gas on, whoosh, a big fire comes on. We all have a pilot light inside of us. It responds to invoking the Spirit of God, who is also within us. It's, it's there, but it's like sitting. And so sometimes at the beginning of a day, or when we're about to face something big, you gotta turn the knob on. You gotta turn the gas on. You have to stir up the Spirit within you, and you'll see the power that comes from that. It was like when I was a kid. Remember the Nesquik chocolate milk? It was always cool when mom brought that home. It was either a powder. If you're really, if you're the rich people had the sauce. Uh, poor kids had the powder. The rich people had the sauce. So you make your, you make your chocolate milk, and then you realize you've got to do something. So what do you do? You put your chocolate milk in the fridge, and you kind of forget about it, and you come back a couple hours later, and what happens? you got the milk on top and the chocolate on the bottom. 
Now, would any child on earth throw that away? Would they say, oh, it's not chocolate milk anymore? Absolutely not. They got to do what? Come on. You got to stir it up, right? You have to stir it up. You got to stir it up. Never underestimate the importance of effort in our faith. The gospel is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. We sometimes have to stir it up. We sometimes have to turn the gas on. And when that happens, that inspires us to be and do more than we ever thought was earthly possible. So that's what's happening. We stir it up, we turn the gas on, and now we are, we've opened up inside of us and around us the, king, the presence and the power of the kingdom of the heavens to do greater things. Everybody say greater things. This is the key to everything. If you're afraid of death, afraid of aging, afraid of all of this stuff, I think this is really what's at the heart of it. So much of the fear of death is, I didn't write that book. I didn't write my, my mother or my grandmother or my old friend from high school. I didn't apologize to so-and-so. I didn't reconcile. I didn't build the thing. I didn't go for it. So, so much of a fear of death is, I'm running out of time to do the thing I was supposed to do. And then as your body gets older or you get an injury or you get a sickness or you, you can't walk as well or go up the stairs like you could or you, you just start to feel like everything's falling apart. But this is not what is in store for you. God has greater things in store for you. You've never been smarter in your life than you are today. You've never had more experience. You've never known more people. You've never made more mistakes. It's those mistakes that cause us to be real experts. And yet we look at our body, we look at it aging, but man, the body does age like milk, I will give you that. But the spirit ages like wine. The spirit ages like wine. And that's it, my friend, is that we, we fail to understand that the power of the mind and the spirit is so much more powerful than the power of the body. Let me unpack this a little more. Right? Interesting, when I write my sermons, uh, I put a little farmer hat on and I, and I grab a clipboard with blank printer paper and a pen and I just write down whatever comes to me and I sort of pray and I think about what I want to talk about. I first start by studying the scripture and then I kind of go from the scripture out into the field and just pray that the Lord would give me something to talk about. And as I was doing this uh, this week, preparing for this sermon, I saw a, a gentleman, this, I, I like to walk this 10 mile loop around Back Bay Nature Preserve. In fact, if you want to meet me personally and you're watching on television or something, just go get a lawn chair and an umbrella and sit at Back Bay Nature Preserve on a Wednesday or a Thursday and you'll see some tall guy walking around with a farmer hat and a clipboard, and that's me. So I see an old gentleman and he's standing there and he's looking out over the water sort of pensively, I think at an eagle or something. And I say to him, hi there, what a beautiful day. He says, it is, it is a beautiful day. And he says, what do you got there? Now, because I'm carrying a clipboard, everybody thinks I'm either like an inspector or a cop or something. I, and I said that I'm not an inspector or a cop, I'm just writing. And he goes, oh, what are you writing? And I said, I'm writing a sermon. I'm a pastor. And he goes, I'm a pastor too. He was a pastor here at Brea Baptist, actually. And, and now, since he's retired, he's been doing burials at sea. And so we stood there and we talked for a while, exchanging some st stories and ideas. And he told me a number of amazing stories. You know, when I was a pastor of a church, when you do funerals, you always do funerals for Christians. And everybody sort of agrees on everything. You sort of have a general idea of what that's going to be like. But now that I do burials at sea, I have all sorts of religions that come. I have atheists that come. And I pray and I read the Bible to them. But he said, the other day I did a Hindu funeral. And it was very odd. You know, I watched them kind of do their thing. And then I just went and did the, the funeral. But he told me a number of wonderful stories. He told me some sad stories. He said one time, a guy, he was, it was a burial sea for his adult daughter. He was pounding the boat, punching the boat like this over and over. And it's his boat. He said, could you please stop doing that? I understand you're grieving. Tell me what's going on. Apparently the guy, um, when his daughter had died the night before, she had called him and said, uh, dad, I, can I come over and talk? I need to talk to you about something. And the dad said, I'm so sorry, I'm buried in work right now, can we talk later? And the next day she took her life. And so he's riddled with this guilt. Another story, he said there was, there was a, a local athlete who was uh, succeeding or something and had a terrible injury and became a quadriplegic. But as a quadriplegic was competing in the Special Olympics and was trying to piece it together, but then just 
started having challenges. One friend said something about, you know, here's this young man, but now very, is very much like a very old man overnight, and talked a lot about the embarrassment of things like diapers and things. And, and, uh, I, and, and then one day, he went to the window of his apartment and just, you know, jumped out. And he said, you know, he said, I think what's happening here is just the power of, of hope and despair. Hope and despair. So many people, they, they lose hope. Here's what despair is. Here's what despair is. Despair is the idea that the greatest things in my life are behind me and not before me. That's what it is. But see, with this young, poor young man, and I don't judge him at all, and I don't know what it's like to go through something like that, but what I imagine happened to this man was he could only see himself as a successful athlete, physical prowess, power, competition, trophies, tried to redo it as a quadriplegic, but it just maybe didn't have the same glory, and now is dealing with this humiliating change in his body. But little did he know that the mind and the spirit are more powerful than the body. And this is what we all have to remember as we age, as we face injury, as we face sickness. Our bodies are important. They're treasures to God. We love them. We want them to be healthy. We have to take care of them. But at the end of the day, the mind and the spirit have more power in this world. Here's the main thing. No matter how sick you are, no matter how broken your body is, no matter how old you're getting, you are here for a reason. And that reason is not your reason. It's God's reason. It's God has a reason. There's not a sparrow in the sky that falls and, does, and the Lord doesn't see it. All is in his loving hands. So the, what is the reason? And that is a good question. That is the question we all ought to answer. And it, it is finding that question that causes despair to evaporate and hope to rise. Here's the main thing. You are alive for a reason, so get the work done. Find out what the work is and get the work done. Get it done. You never know. There could be one more person you're supposed to talk to, one person you're supposed to pray for, one more gift you have to give, one more thing you need to say, one more song you need to sing, one more thing you need to write, but it needs to be done. That's why you're here. You're not here to fill space. You're here to get something for God's purposes done, and discovering that is so key to obtaining a life of greater things. Here's what I believe. I believe that for every Christian especially, the last day of your life should be the best day of your life. That on the last day of your life, especially if you know what it is, you're not going to spend just that day sitting around. You're going to spend that day praying for someone, encouraging someone, writing someone, making a phone call. This is what it means to wake up every day, no matter how many challenges are in your life, to wake up with a purpose. And let me tell you, you have a purpose. It doesn't matter what your body is doing, your spirit and mind are doing something else. And that is where we find true life every single day. Navy SEALs have this thing called Hell Week. And if, there, if there's anything that was appropriately named, I just watched a documentary on it, Hell Week would be a great description. These young men and women who want to be Navy SEALs, or perhaps it's just men, I'm not sure, but these young people who want to be Navy SEALs, they have to go through this arduous week where all sorts of challenges are hoisted upon them. They have to be, they go through all sorts of drowning exercises. They're constantly cold and hungry. They're only able to sleep four hours a day. They're constantly being shot at with blanks from guns to keep their adrenaline going. One guy was saying how by the day uh, day two or three, you get so hungry and tired and exhausted. He said, you go into this little room and that's the only time you're a little bit warm and you're given 20 minutes to eat your food. And he said he fell asleep and woke up with his face in his spaghetti. <laughs> and then he said he hurriedly ate his spaghetti and went outside. And as soon as you go back outside, they make you get down in a push-up position and they spray you with freezing water. It's in the winter. They put sand all over you. And so you're covered in sand and water. You're hungry, you're tired. By day three or four, you start hallucinating. You start seeing things. You start mumbling to yourself. Your body is broken. Sometimes people die during Hell Week. Sometimes people drown or die of pneumonia. And at any minute, any of these people can go and ring this bell. There's this brass 
bell. And this bell is your ticket home at the worst time when you're at your lowest. And the, the drill sergeants are encouraging you, go ring that bell. You're not fit. You're not good enough. Go ring that bell. And at any minute, you can. You can just go. And you know what that bell means? It can all be over. I can go home into a warm bed. I can go see my friends. I can go see my girlfriend. I can go to a movie with my friends. I can go have a nice warm meal, go take a nice hot shower. I can go sleep. All that bell, all I got to do is ring that bell. Most of them do. 75% of those people do. But 25% of them don't. And when I watch this video, I think, what is it that causes a young man with all of that? It's not like the job pays very well. What causes them to not ring that bell when they're broken, tired, muttering to themselves? Why don't they ring that bell? Do you know why? I mean, I have a guess. Because they have a mission. There's a certain type of person that has contempt for the bell and all that it symbolizes. The easy way out. I think that person is you. That's why you're here. You're not the type of person to ring the bell. And that's my encouragement for you. This is what William McRaven said to Admiral in his, in his speech. Net, just don't ring the bell. You want to change the world? Don't ring the bell. Maybe you're getting old. Maybe you have an injury. Maybe you have a challenge, a sickness, a, a setback. First of all, God might heal those things. Sometimes quadriplegics get better. Sometimes knees get better. Sometimes brains get better. Sometimes bodies get better. Sometimes people live longer than they're supposed to. But second, it doesn't matter. You have a thing, a mission, something for you. Find what it is and get the work done. Don't ring the bell. Don't ring the bell. Don't do it. In seminary, we learn that there's two types of sin. There's the sin of commission and the sin of omission. The sin of commission is the type of sin that a lot of churches like to preach against. You know, don't, you know, that's what we think of murder, adultery, lying, stealing, uh, lying on your golf score, cutting in line at Disneyland. <laughs> sins of omission, so the sins of commission are the things you do, sins of omission are the things you don't do. The things you don't do. The things that nobody else sees except for God. The things that only you and God know you did. Here's the sin of omission. It's not praying. Not praying, not participating, not asking, not developing, not acting, not forgiving, not giving it all you can, not getting up despite how you feel. That's the omission. And in my humble opinion, I think that almost every sin of commission is first preceded by a sin of omission. We omit enough from our lives. We need those other things to distract us. See, this is the thing, is that you want a greater life, you want a greater things kind of life? I know you do. I know you do. I know you want the greatest things in your life to be ahead of you and not behind you. If you want a greater things kind of life, here's how you do it. You pray greater prayers. You have greater friends. You give greater effort. You love with greater love to a greater amount of people. You live a greater life with greater vision and greater commitment. You give all that you have to all you can, the best you can, all the time. That is a great life. It sounds exhausting. It's not. It's a thrill. And it's something you can do today. Here's another way of saying it. Work harder on yourself than you do on anything else. Work on you. Work on you. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work harder on yourself than you do on any of your hobbies or your business. Or Work on you. Because when you change, everything changes. When you get better, everything get, gets better. When you get smarter, everything improves. When you learn more, everything gets better. When you have a better heart, better mind, better energy, all your relationships and life, and everything gets better. Everything gets greater. So despair is saying, I don't like what my future looks like. Despair says, I don't like myself. Despair says, I don't like how I feel. Despair says, I don't like what I know about me. Here's what hope and faith and, and a powerful, greater things kind of life says. It says, I feel great about the future, and I feel great about who I'm becoming. Even if you're not who you want to be today, if you know you're going to get there someday, 
boy, that changes everything. I feel great about who I'm becoming. And no doubt we need to rest, we need to relax, we need Sabbath. But even then, don't turn Sabbath and rest into phone and TV time. Turn it into real rest. You know, a nice walk, a good prayer, a good meal, time with people you love. Make it all count. Make every minute, every day count. And your life will begin to change forever. We talk about heaven. You know it's the only thing you can take to heaven? The only thing you can take to heaven is who you become. So, Father, we ask for that in Jesus' name, that you would help us to become all that is possible for us. First, we trust our lives to you. We have contempt for, for death. We won't taste its sting. We have contempt for age. We don't care. We just trust in you and we receive your spirit and we ask in Jesus' name you help us to become all that we can be. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The preceding program was made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.